record this. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Michael. I'm filling in for Nicholas, who is abroad. He sends his regards. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Marta Marchegiano, who is a postdoctoral research at the University of Granada in Spain. Um, Dr. Marchegiano uh, completed her undergraduate degree and her master's degree in Italy before moving on to her PhD at the University of Geneva under Daniel Rizzagoy on the quaternary ostracot assemblages from lacustrine records with the aim of reconstructing the paleoclimate in the central and eastern Mediterranean basins since the late uh, Pleistocene. She then moved on to do her first postdoc at Imperial College in London on the impact of uh, climate change during the Middle Eo Eocene from carbonate clumped isotopes and ostracot assemblages. Uh, from there, she moved to the, the Free University of Brussels, where she led a project pioneering the use of carbonate clumped isotope techniques on ostracot shells to develop a new reliable paleothermometer for lacustrine environments. And I believe that's what she's going to talk about um, today. Uh, this is a novel approach that has led her to be involved with the ICDP, the International Continental Drilling uh, Program, um, as well as uh, being awarded numerous uh, um, research grants for, uh, for this technique, including her current position, uh, or postdoc position at the University of Geneva. So without further ado, Marta. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and to all of you to be here today. So um, as already mentioned, I'm going to introduce you this new tool that is to reconstruct quantitative uh, continental climate change and that involved the use of uh, clamped isotope on ostracod shells. Okay. So we are now all aware about, unfortunately, the destiny of our planet and the IPCC panel estimate an increase of up to five degrees of global warming by 200, 2100. And, uh, but this is a global data and we, we aim to know what is gonna be the effect of this increase on specific area, because it could be very different. In some area it could be more uh, uh, precipitation, in other more aridity, et cetera, et cetera. And to do that, we used um, past uh, climate events as modern analog, and in particular, um, in particular, lacustrine sediments are very powerful uh, for as a paleoclimatic and paleoenvironmental archives because they are able to record even um, very um, fast and uh, climatic events. Okay, however, while working on uh, regional paleoclimatic reconstructions, we have... Ma sorry, Marta, you are not in presentation mode. Ah, uh, no? It's in uh, the viewer, in viewer mode. You need to go to presentation mode. We, we see your next slide also. Ah, okay. Uh... You need to, to choose in the, the, the share screen the right uh, presentation. Okay, let's check. No, no, not here. Go to share screen. Down, the green bottom. At okay. the bottom. And here, um, I only have like seminar. Yeah, I don't have any different. Okay, try to do it in presentation mode again. Let, let's see if it works. Mm -hmm. No, still. Same. Um, let me check. Again, it's um, delete the share screen and try again. Stop the share screen. 
the, the again the green bottom at the, at the bottom share screen at the bottom yeah i found it but um Mm -hmm. Stop sharing, okay. Now go back to share screen. Ah, okay, okay. Bro, I understood. And there you you have different options for sharing. Maybe this one will work. Let's see. Yeah, it's now it's working. Thank you. Yeah, no, because I had two, I have two different, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the other one. Yeah, a common problem. <laughs> okay, no, sorry. Sorry, continue. So as I was say, say, saying, during uh, doing um, regional paleoclimatic reconstruction, we have some challenges. And the first one is to have accurate knowledge of the regional settings, because we need to be able to separate the global effect to the regional one. And also we need to choose the most suitable proxies. Uh, to give you an example, while working on stable classic isotopes in a marine environment, they in general, it in general depends on uh, temperatures and uh, the delta O18 of uh, the, the water, so the isotopical composition of the water. But in lacustrine environment, this signal is even more complicated. In fact, the isotopical composition depends on the isotopical composition of the precipitation and also the, um, the hydrological condition of the lake. So if it's open, it mainly depends on precipitation. If it's closed, on the evaporation precipitation uh, ratio. So today I'm going to introduce you this new technique, almost new because it's already exists since uh, 17 years. A uh, clamped isotope is based on the temperature dependence abundance of the bonds between C13 and O18 in CO2 that are quantified with what we call delta 47. So what's happened is that at very high temperatures, heavy isotopes are randomly distributed. And while temperatures start to decrease, they start to clump, they tend to clump together. So the delta 47 is directly correlated to the temperature of precipitation of the carbonate and so of the water in which this precipitation happened. Also by combining these two proxies, so delta 47 and the classic oxygen isotope, we have the temperatures thanks to the um, clamped isotope, because as you can see in the formula, it only depends by this volume, so the delta 47. We have the uh, classic stable isotope. And then by using the formula of, for example, Kimonil 97, we can calculate the delta 18 of the water. Another problem in a classic stable isotope is what we call a uh, disequilibrium of vital effect. This is an offset between the signal recorded by uh, the organism and the one we have in, a, in the case of a precipitation of an inorganic site in the system without um, this offset. So for um, carbonate clamped isotope, there are some organisms such as for amnifera, mollusk, and coccolites that doesn't have this vital effect. And this is very important because for in the case of stable isotope is specific dependent. It means that every time you use, for example, a foraminifera, you have to know this offset for each species and correct the final value for this um, offset, for this value. However, some corals and echinoderms present vital effect even in the um, carbonate clamped isotope signal. Um, this technique has been very used, a lot used in marine environment. However, in lacustrine system, it's still not uh, widely used. They use some mollusk and bicarbonate, but there are some problems. For example, mollusks are present only in very few levels or there are fragments of shells. So it's hard to define the species. And also they are made of instable aragonite. 
So they can lose the original signal and record the diagenetical one. And for bulk carbonate, it could be a mix of carbonate be deposited in the system and ones coming from outside. So to record the original signal is very important to understand which are the carbonate precipitate inside uh, the lake. Because of that, uh, we feel the urgency to find another um, organism that could that can be more um, useful in lacustrine environment. And for that, I uh, wrote this project that as proud Italian I called Carbonara, that involved the use of clamped isotope on ostracod shells. So ostracod shells, I don't know if you ever um, hear about them. They are tiny aquatic crustaceans. So we check them at the microscope. They grow by molting. They have uh, eight different uh, shells before they became adult. And every time they change it, they can live in all kinds of water bodies, so rivers, lakes, ponds, even in fountains in the city centers. And they are very sensitive to the variation of several ecological parameters, such as salinity, pH, temperature, and etc. And for that, up to now, they are um, they have been used a lot to reconstruct the uh, paleoclimatic and environmental change in the lacustrine system. But why I think they are the perfect target for plant isotope? It's because first they are the unique microfossils. Uh, that have a carbonate shells in lakes or the most common. They are widespread. They can live at different climatic belts and different climatic conditions. They are present since the Ordovician, so they have pretty long fossil uh, records. And these allow also to have high resolution studies. Um, on the contrary of mollusk, their shells is made by low magnesium calcite that is more stable and easy to preserve. And they are autogenic, so we can be sure that they preserve the signal, the temperature signal of the lake that we are studying, and it's not a mix of something coming from outside. So Carbonara is mainly divided, divided in two parts. The first part is um, a check of this technique. We wanted to understand if we can apply clumped on ostracod shells and if uh, they present a vital effect or not. And the second part is the application of these new uh, paleothermometers on lacustrine records to reconstruct paleoclimatic um, condition in the past. So the first step was to understand if we can apply clamped and recognize the presence of a vital effect. For that, I cultivate ostracods in the um, Natural Museum in Brussels. This is a species called Heterocypris incongruens, and um, we cultivated it at 24 degrees in the lab. And I also collect ostracod species from a natural environment. So here, for example, I was in Granada. Uh, I collect species called um, Herpetocypris elene in these uh, rivers and ponds that are um, where we know the temperatures because they are feeding by groundwater. Uh, and so it's constant at around 12 degrees. This was in the same months in uh, Ghent. So you can see the difference of uh, temperatures because this pond was a uh, four degrees. And you can see that by my... Uh, the outfit I had that was different from one to other. And this is just to show that by the end of my collection, I was able to have the right outfit to go inside the lake uh, that I didn't have at the, at the beginning of my campaign. The second step was to um, develop a cleaning protocol. So I, I tried two different ones, only uh, the first one by cleaning the shells manually and a second one by using also a bit of hydro um, of H2O2. But the results were the same. So at the end, one is in, you can use both of them. So what I did was kind of serial killer job because after I collect all these shells, 
I had to open each shell manually with two needles, remove the body, clean uh, the shells from the organic matter. So I made this kind of washing machine that started here by removing the body and everything. Then the shells were made um, in the H2O2 for three minutes. And then again, clean with, um, um, with some water. And yeah, so as you can see, it's something uh, quite crazy because at the moment for the analysis, we need around five milligram of carbonate. And yeah, for ostracots, you represent thousands of shells. So yeah, it was a bit long. <laughs> and the last step was to analyze them with the new instrument system that we have in, um, in a Brussels where I did um, the second postdoc. This machine, this instrument is made by two different parts. This first one here is um, when the reaction happened with the acid, orthophosphoric acid and the carbonate, there is the CO2 produced and then is cleaning in this uh, system made by different traps to remove organic matter and other contaminants. And then the CO2 is um, transported in the mass spec for the analysis. So what we want to know is to understand the relationship be between the delta 47 and temperatures for uh, ostracots, because no one ever did that. So this was the first studies and we need to be sure if um, we can apply this technique, if the value we had were the right one. And uh, so we applied it to the speeches I collect in the, um, in the different setting and the ones that I uh, cultivated in the lab. And one, one thing I forget to mention is that in the ponds in Ghent, um, I found two different speeches. So there were two different species that uh, grow at the same time in the same environment at the same temperatures. And this was mainly to check the presence of a vital effect because if they collect, they record the same temperatures, it means that we don't have a vital effect. If there is an offset between the two, it means that something happened. So, uh, in the previous studies, uh, at the beginning of the application of the clamped isotope technique, people studied foraminifera and other um, lacustrine carbonates, and they were doing a ca specific calibration for each organism. So, for example, if we look at the foraminifera, they had to collect a lot of data to understand what is the fitting the formula that we can use to um, have the right temperature while, while applying clamped on foraminifera. But thanks to the effort of Anderson et al. in 2021, they put all together the um, biogenic and uh, inorganic that present a vital effect or a disequilibrium effect. And they see, they saw that they fall all on the same line. So they made this uh, formula that we call now the unified calibration that can be used to all the um, carbonates that doesn't present this offset. And for that, it was enough for us to check on these four samples that precipitated at different temperatures to check if they also fell on the same line. And so if they follow the, the behavior of all the other carbonates. So as you see here, the all the all the samples I got fell on the same line. So this confirmed that we can apply clamped isotope. And the two samples that come from the pond in Gans and that precipitated at uh, four degrees. There are two different speeches. They also record the right temperature, both of them. So indicate that there is no vital effect. By uh, plotting this data, the ostracot data with the other one made from bivalves and foraminifera, they all fell on the same line. So we can confirm that both marine and lacustrine biogenic carbonates 
doesn't present, um, or at least for us, Saco doesn't present um, a vital effect, and we can use the unified calibration to uh, calculate the right temperatures, and thus we don't need a specific Ostracode calibration. This is a lot because it means that we don't need to collect thousand of, well, thousand no, but multiple samples to have an Ostracode specific uh, calibration. So to conclude this first part, we can uh, confirm that we can apply clumped on ostracots and, yeah, and that there is no vital effect. So this means that we can use different species of ostracots without calculating the uh, vital offset of uh, each species that instead happen for the um, for the classic isotope, Ostracots present vital effect for classic oxygen isotope. And so every time in the past, and even now they use this um, technique, they had to uh, know this of vital offset. And this, it's not uh, necessary for clumped. So we can use uh, different species even in the past, uh, the one that are not living today or species that are um, um, unique in one lake system. So the second part was the application of these novel thermometers on um, paleoclimatic record. Uh, particularly, we decide to work on the Mediterranean area. This is because it's a uh, very sensitive areas for uh, climate change, uh, mainly because uh, if you see in this picture, there are several kinds of clim different climates. So the effect of the increase of temperature in the future is going to be very different on each specific area. And also because it, it has been calculated that it's um, temperature are increasing 20% faster comparing to other area. So in the past, uh, a lot of scientists uh, studied this area. There are a lot of record around, but there are still a lot of open questions for the paleoclimate. And during my PhD, uh, we decided to work on uh, central Italy, that is a good representation of central Mediterranean area. And specifically, we selected uh, Lake Trasimeno that is located here in Umbria, in central Italy, because it's at the border of um, um, the, an important border between the climate of the south and the climate of the north in Italy, and so of the Mediterranean, uh, central Mediterranean area. This lake is particularly interesting because it's a closed lake. It's quite large, 124 kilometers. It's uh, shallow with a maximum depth of six meters, but in average, it's around three meters. It has a smooth bathymetry. And because of this characteristic, the hydrology of the lake is strictly depends on the local climate, but also the temperatures are pretty close to the atmospheric one. So during my PhD, we uh, did different studies. As I told you at the beginning, it's very important to know the regional area. So to know also how is Lake Trasimeno today. And we did in collaboration with the University of Roma Tre. And at the time I was doing my PhD in Geneva, we collect uh, living ostracots because no one ever did that before. So we wanted to know the Ostracod fauna in this lake to help us in the interpretation of uh, the past, um, the fossil record. So we collect Ostracod assemblages in, um, together with uh, geochemical parameters. We also collect uh, sediments from the bottom and uh, macrophytes. There are a lot of information that you can find in this uh, paper, Marchegiano et al. 2017. But what was most important is that we found um, 
completely different fauna in the center of the lake and in the shallow area. This is because the center of the lake doesn't have a lot of uh, um, vegetation and also the light is not, it, as it's a shallow lake, it's all the time, um, the, the water is really moving all the time. So they, there is no light in, that go on the bottom and probably for that, there are only two species that are able to live in the deeper part of the lake. And then in uh, 2014, I went together with uh, people from the University of Köln to uh, collect a core in the deepest part of the lake. This core is a um, um, nine meter sedimentary core that cover the last 47,000 um, years, more or less. And um, so the, this time period in the global uh, um, or the North Hemisphere area is characterized by alternation of um, warmer and humid interstadial event that are the peak that you can see here and by colder and uh, more arid stadial event. So we want to understand the effect of this rapid uh, climatic change in uh, Lake Trasimeno and so in the central Mediterranean area. To do that, during my PhD, we did several sedimentological and, and geochemical analysis. For example, the total organic carbon that, as you see here, was very low in the older part and then increase at the change, um, at the transition between Pleistocene and Holocene. And I was mainly focused on the micropaleontological analysis um, of the ostracod assemblages. And we collect samples uh, in continuity every two centimeters. So this record was very rich on ostracon shells, um, likely for the interpretation, but not really for me because I spent hours and hours doing the picking of those samples. And we found 19 species of ostracods belong to the, that belong to 15 genera. The ones in this um, red square are not living today in uh, Lake Trasimeno, and they completely disappeared at the Pleistocene-Holocene transition, indicating a big change of uh, the, or a, a big environmental change in uh, Lake Trasimeno. So in this diagram, you see uh, we plotted all the main species the ostracod species against the North Greenland isotopic curves. So we compare the local signal, in this case, the ostracod assemblages with the global one to understand the effect of this global climatic change, in particular, stadial, interstadial, and the Henrik events that are the one in red that are even colder and, are, and more arid than um, the stadial event. So to understand the effect on Lake Trasimeno. And in general, what we found is that in the MIS-3, that is considered as mild and hum humid period, the main species present is the, this yellow one called Cipridae storosa. These species uh, live only in permanent lake. And for that, we were able to say that uh, at the moment, the lake was a permanent lake and low saline lake, as you can see in this picture. So very similar to today's um, situation in Lake Trasimeno. And during the cold and dry MIS-2, uh, the main species were Sarcipridopsis aculeata and Mareotica, the light blue and the blue one. Uh, those species are um, particular because they can survive uh, during a period of uh, where the lake was completely dry, so there was no water. Uh, we still don't know if they are able to have to go in a kind of hibernation, so they close the shells and they leave hibernating during the season where there is no water, 
or if they can survive by uh, eggs. So it's only the eggs that survive to the drier season. Anyway, as you see, uh, Cipriles storosa was very abundant here, but decreased going upward. Instead, these two other species, uh, Mariotica and Aculeata, uh, were more abundant. This indicate that the lake level was lower, or that was in a system um, of temporary pools where there were no water, at least for part of the year. So we can imagine a situation like this one. So very different from the one we have now. Instead, in the Holocene, uh, Torosa, as well as other species like Angulata, that can uh, that are sorry that are not able to survive in a drier period, uh, reappear again, indicating the situation like today. So again, a permanent lake. During my PhD, I also spent um, three months at the Queen Mary University in London, where I applied a transfer function called Mutual Obstacle Temperature Range Method on all the samples uh, belong to this core in Lake Trasimeno. This transfer function is made by combining the living geographic distribution and the World Climate Database. What, it, how it works is that by combining the range of uh, temperature at which each species can live, we found the common temperature range. So for example, in this uh, sample, uh, January temperature were between minus 10 and minus 5, and July between 16 and 21. By applying this technique to the entire record, we had this, uh, these uh, temperature curves uh, from January minimum, maximum, and July minimum and maximum temperatures. And these allow us to say that the dry cold, um, stadial event were also colder in Lake Trasimeno, and the humid interstadial were also warmer because we found a pretty nice um, fit between the um, temperature variation and the, um, the Greenland interstadial curve, as well as the variation in uh, ostracot assemblages and so in the uh, hydrology of the lake. But as you see in this picture, we have a range of temperature and sometimes this range is very large. For example, here is from minus 30 to um, almost five degrees. I mean, yeah, it's important, but it's a big range of temperature and it's not really useful. So this te technique was useful for us to identify the bigger temperature change along the core, to select samples for the next technique, the clamped isotope um, um, paleo thermometer. So during my postdoc at the VUB, I applied this technique for the first time on this record and also on, on fossil record on fossil uh, ostracots shells. And so we selected, as I told you, the main um, temperature variation. And for example, in the MIS3, when we, we had a permanent lake condition, we used Cipride storosa, that was the most abundant species. This species precipitated its shell during uh, May, August period. And uh, today, in average, um, Lake Trasimeno water has 20 through 23 degrees during May, August. So this uh, green line. What we can say from our results is that during MIS3 temperature were from one degrees to eight degrees lower than today that the warmer and humid interstadial events ranged from two to four degrees higher than the stadial, so this one, and that Enric events, the H4, was the coldest event at 15 degrees. Going upwards from late MIS-3 for the entire MIS-2, 
the condition in Lake Trasimeno changed. It was much more lower with the femoral ponds. So we didn't have enough uh, Cipride Storosa, and we used the most abundant one, that is Sarcipridopsis aculeata. This species precipitates its shell more during summer, so there is a difference of one degree in average temperature today in Lake Trasimeno, so the average is 24 degrees. In this time period, temperatures are from 6 to 13 degrees lower than today, so uh, much more colder. The Hendrick events are progressively warmer from the older one age three to the younger one age one. So from 11 to 15 degrees. The Greenland Stadial two is the warmest event at 18 degrees. And the younger Drias, that is the last um, stadial event of this uh, uh, time period was at 17 degrees. Um, at the Holocene transition, we still have this situation and temperature increase a lot. And they are close to the today temperatures that are from 20 to 26 degrees. During the Holocene and the recent time, again, we use Cipride Storosa because those species disappeared because again, we had a completely change in the environment in Lake Trasimeno, and these species record exactly the temperature we have uh, today at Lake Trasimeno during summer. So what we want to do also is to check if the vital effect that it's not present in living ostracods, as I showed you at the beginning, was also not present in the uh, fossil record. And for that, we measure two different species, um, Mareotica and Aculeata and Salina and Aculeata in um, presenting the same uh, samples. And you see that they record exactly the same temperature or at least in the um, um, error bar. So we can confirm that there is no vital effect even in the fossil record. However, at a certain point, I was feeling very confident and say, okay, let's check on other species. And yeah, it was a disaster because I, said, I had these two species recording from the same samples, recording completely different temperatures. And I say, oh my God, what is happening? Uh, this is a disaster. But then I went back to the bibliography and discovered that this species, Candon angulata, is a winter species. So it precipitates its shells during winter months. And so the temperature recorded by angulata are winter. And the one from Torosa are summer one. And by doing that, we see that it's very close to today temperatures, both summer, uh, winter and summer. So it's not a problem of vital effect, but seasonality. This means that it's true that we can combine different shells together, but we need to pay attention because we can combine different species belong to the same season. So the one that precipitate shells during summer can be mixed together and the one during winter the same. But if we are going to combine both of them, we can have an average temperature of the year probably, but I suggest that it's better to separate ostracod species for this technique. And then uh, as mentioned at the beginning, by using the formula of Kim and O'Neill 97, we can calculate the isotopical comp composition of the water. So this signal in Lake Trasimeno is quite complicated because it's a closed lake. So it depends um, more by the evaporation precipitation ratio. And uh, so there are a lot of parameters to take into account and I'm still working on that, but I want to show you the preliminary results. And um, so we can in general say that we have a decrease of precipitations going from the MIS-2 to the Holocene, and then um, they increase again during the Holocene. And this is what 
we observe also with the ostracod assemblages because we have a lower lake level that became higher um, in the in the Holocene. So to conclude my um, my seminar today, uh, the take-home message is that the Ostracod Delta 47 uh, thermometer is a new proxy that can provide new information, mainly on um, critical uh, um, continental um, paleoclimatic reconstruction or complex environments, because as you see, um, at least clumped isotope give you uh, right temperatures and not a mix of temperature and precipitation as in the case of uh, uh, classic stable isotope. So I'm now working on different proxy because this was just a first application. Um, so yeah, I have to, to improve this thermometer to, to using it on a on different area and uh, but I'm, I hope I convinced you that this is a new proxy that can help you in the paleoclimatic uh, uh, reconstruction. So thank you very much for your attention and to all the different funding and university that helped me in uh, realizing this uh, project. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, questions? Anybody? Hi. Can everyone hear me? Mm, not so good. Yes. yes. Oh, this is good. Thank you so much. This is really, this is really, really interesting um, work, of course. Um, I wanted to, I mean, you you address this um, with the issue of the seasonality, but when you I thought it was interesting that when you talked about the temperatures, I'm assuming that when you talked about the minus five to minus 10 range, you're talking about air temperatures, right? You're, 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 th that's, 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 a uh, the proxy, the proxy air temperatures for similar today, because the, the low temperatures, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, so it's water temperatures, but in the case of Lake Trasimenos, it's a shallow lake. They are very close to the atmospheric one. But um, just checking here, so there are no negative yeah, temperatures. I mean, the idea that they they are you know survive because I guess the question I'm asking is if they if they're if they're actually precipitating their shells. Ah, okay, so this was for so the transfer how function. So how do you, how do you, how does that? Uh... Yeah, exactly, no, in fact, this is for, so clumped isotope record the precipitation of shells, the, the, the carbonate shells, so it's the temperature of the water. But the range I show you before, this one was made with the transfer function, so this, is um, connected to the atmospheric temperatures at which ostracods um, of the place where ostracods was found. And of course, you are right. So they were found living, I don't know, in places where during winter is minus 30, but yeah, they don't precipitate their shells at minus 30 because they, I don't know, the species I studied, they need at least nine degrees. So this is the big limitation of uh, using a transfer function because it's related to atmospheric temperatures. So they, they can probably survive because the ice was, uh, I mean, they, 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 there was ice in the lake. And so at the bottom they survived, but it's not the season while they precipitated the shells. And uh, or probably they die, and then uh, there is only a summer, um, a summer um, generation, and not during winter. But what we got with the clumped, this is the temperature at which the ostracod precipitate. That are really, I mean, they are reasonable because we have um, temperature close to today in the case of interstadial and Hendrik. The minimum we had is. 12 degrees. 
and this is uh, quite reasonable because even in other records uh, that use pollen transfer function, those are the temperature in a central Mediterranean area for this time period. Okay, we have two questions in, in the chat. Um, are you going to apply this proxy to other environments? Yes, so my main thing was to working on lacustrine environments um, because in a marine environment, of course, people, scientists in, are using forums. But I'm now uh, applying it on marine ostracods to check if we can use it in marine uh, environment, because sometimes uh, for, there are not enough forums or um, they are not well preserved, some other problems. So we can even, we can combine the two proxy using forums when we have forums and uh, ostracods when there are ostracods. And uh, now here in, um, in uh, Granada, I'm going to work on Padul Lake that is in, um, in this area. So another record from Mediterranean area. And uh, with this project from ICDP, um, I will work on lakes in uh, Guatemala and um, Kenya and Tanzania. So this is the first application. And yeah, I'm super excited to work on different areas because actually in the last 10 years, I mainly work on Lake Trasimeno. I start to be a bit tired of writing the geological setting of this area. Yes. The, the other question is, let's say if you have four to five species of ostracods in a lake record, uh, mm -hmm. while doing oxygen isotope, how do you determine which species to use for the isotopic analysis? Uh, easy, the most abundant. <laughs> you use the most abundant because for clumped um, isotope, uh, you need five milligrams. So for each, in, in the case of species I used, it ranged from 300 to 700 shells. So what you can do, it's also combining uh, several uh, samples belong to the same climatic events. What I did uh, here, you see that is uh, there is this uncertainty on the age. It's because I combine several, um, um, several samples belong to the age three to have an average temperature of this event. And uh, so what you can do is also, I, I always think that it's important to do a, a paleo, micro paleontological analysis be, before applying uh, geochemical ones, because you need to understand the environment uh, and knows the species and when they precipitate in the, their shells. So in the case you have 45 uh, species, you can select the most abundant and combine them together for clumped isotope. Instead, for the stable isotope, what is important is to know the vital offset because you have to correct this value for the vital offset. And so what's happened is that if you combine several species, then you can reconstruct uh, the precipitation because you need to correct this value for the vital offset. And if you combine different species, they can have a vital offset different. Or you combine species that has the same uh, vital offset or that there are known because some of them precipitated at equilibrium. For example, um, uh, Aculeata and Mareotica, they uh, precipitate at equilibrium, so you don't need to correct them. So yeah, it's a bit tricky. It's not so easy and you need to have some knowledge also, or at least working with the paleo, micro paleontological uh, experts. We can just mix everything together. This will be easy, but yeah, no, it's not the case. Great. And, and one last question before we really have to go. What is the salinity reconstruction range based on your results? It's... Um, hmm. Let's check here. Voila. It's from um, minus, let's say minus one to, to three. That is very close to the one we have uh, today. So these two samples are, um, I mean, they are the two species, the summer one and the winter one coming from recent samples. And they, um, they record exactly uh, the isotopical composition of the water we have now, 
uh, that is uh, so it's more or less two per mil difference between summer and winter that correspond also to a decrease of up to two meters of the lake level between summer and winter because we have more precipitation in winter and less in summer but mainly the temperature are very high, uh, close even to 40 degrees, 35 degrees. And so we have a lot of evaporation during summer. Great, thank you very much. We really appreciate thank you. you and uh, hope to see you soon in person. Yeah, I hope to come soon in Haifa. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. bye.